I'm here to present the, um, the research mapping exercise that I carried out on behalf of UCL's um, uh, Grand Challenge um, of Sustainable Cities and the Institute of Sustainable Resources. Um, and the brief was to sort of scope all the, the variety of research that's going on at UCL connected to resources and to cities, and then think of ways to connect them and to visualize these. Um, and the sort of the motivation behind this was exactly the research imperative that we've been hearing about today, the kind of the, the, um, the fact that resource management of cities is a critical and growing issue. Um, and this symposium has shown us a sort of incredibly diverse range of, of um, examples. Um, um, diverse ranges of analysing um, problems um, and evaluating different types of solutions. But I'm stepping a little bit back from this, um, away from the analysis of specific problems, to talk a little bit um, about the type of, of knowledge that we're producing at universities um, and whether it's fit for the task that, that um, is required given the sort of imperative of climate change. Because this is the question that really came out of the research mapping exercise. And so just to start, I wanted to start with these two images, which for me are quite... A, sort of clear way of um, thinking about how we frame knowledge about cities. So um, here on the right, we've got the 1867 cross-section of the embankment. Um, and this is how you plan a city with resources. You need some pipes, that's number one. Two, sewage. Three, transport. Um, and this, for me, is sort of a really clear example of the, uh, the aesthetics of industrial modernity, that you can separate nature and use it as a resource um, for urban development. And then contrasting that, you've got the picture that we're much more used to um, in terms of how we imagine our cities today as highly complex. So you've got the kind of aesthetics of complexity next to it. And that cities are highly um, uncertain places where uh, complex, open systems interact in ways that, that we can't really um, know or interpret. Um, I mean, you know, we, we can't manage as easily as, as that image from 1867 would suggest. Um, so the idea was sort of to take you um, in the next 20 minutes into this sort of to leave behind the disciplinary separations of industrial modernity and to take you into a post-disciplinary space um, where, where these sort of abstract connections between research can be, um, can be visualised and explored. So I'm going to take you there and then I'm going to plunge you from that sort of purified space of the ivory tower into a much less fragrant space of London's sewage system. Um, <laughs> which is, for me, a really good, not to mention very local example, um, of the relationship between the way that we organise knowledge, the way we organise our cities, and how that shapes the way we consume and value and use resources. Um, I'm just going to sort of slide through, because I think I was going to talk about the motivation um, behind this and the need for sustainable cities to sort of bring together different disciplinary perspectives, but I think that the symposium has done a fairly good job of convincing us of the need for that and, and of the benefits. Um, one thing to mention, though, is, is the difficulties um, of doing multi, multi-discipline work, um, particularly when you're using a normative concept like sustainability. Um, so the sort of lens that I adopted was one called environmental justice. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar um, with this theoretical framing about how um, we're producing knowledge about the environment. Um, but um, it's a perspective, really, that questions um, that, that shaped the way I, I approached the, the research landscape at UCL. So I was talking to researchers here. I was looking at the different sources of information that UCL keeps about the kind of research about cities and resources. Um, and rather than sort of asking about what different disciplines are doing, I was sort of asking, OK, what is this research about imagining the future and designing the tools um, and the strategies that we need to get there? Or is it normative and is it focused on improving the metabolic processes of cities? Um, or is it analysing inequalities? Or is it um, contrasting institutionalised worldviews and, and, and thinking critically about how we're producing knowledge? Um, so these were the kind of um, questions I was asking. Um, and I think there's some sort of validity in adopting this environmental justice perspective because when I did the survey, which 185 people responded to, so thanks to anyone who filled out the survey, 62% um, of people did say they researched sustainability, but 36% of people said they didn't research, they had no interest in sustainability, or they didn't research it. And 30% also um, refused to identify with the discipline. So I think there is some sort of 
scope for using different types of ways to classify people's research and to bring together um, different ways to connect their research perspectives. So I'll just take you now to the kind of tool. Um, um, so this is the way, what you're seeing here, basically, each red dot is a researcher at UCL. Um, I'm sorry if you're not from UCL, because it's a bit um, incestuous. But, um, and what they're doing in this sort of white conceptual space, so this is anyone who's related, whose research is um, related to cities or resources, um, and they're here either because I've looked at their profile on the institutional research system, or they've answered a survey and, and identified themselves as being interested. And this is how they're made up currently. Um, so these are the departments. Um, and you can see different departments are represented sort of more strongly, obviously, the Bartlett faculties of architecture planning and, and these kinds of departments are there. Um, and then you can draw together. So UCL has a number of themes that you can select if you're interested. So if we select sustainable cities, um, what you can then see is how is the relative distance between departments to, to a specific research theme. So the, the triangles and the departments and the different colored triangles, which isn't coming up very well, are this sort of theme. So you can see that departments pulled in very close. So here, um, if, you, if you look down in that corner there, you can see the name of the department. So we're looking at DPU, the De Development Planning Unit is very close because a lot of the you know, the proportion of researchers who are working on sustainable cities brings the department in versus something like geography, which is a little bit further out. Um, so that was the idea. Um, but I wanted to look using slightly different ca classifications. So if you take um, from an environmental justice perspective, who's working on empowerment and inequality, you can then see how the departments are pushed, and you can see which departments are kind of... Um, taking ownership of, of a particular research theme. Um, so here you've got uh, this one, again, DPU pulled in very close, whereas though the Energy Institute, a little bit further out in terms of inequality and uh, uh, empowerment. Um, and then you can change that to imagining the future, which would pull in something like the Energy Institute, which obviously does a lot of future scenario building work. And so then the idea was being that this might be an interesting way for people to organise um, to think about research differently and to think about how they could bring their, their approaches and perspectives in line with, with other people's sort of um, approaches. So um, the other um, imperative also was to sort of look in terms of um, resources. So in fact, when Emily Morris um, was talking, she was saying that, um, you know, in Latin America, there are a lot of people who work on there are a few projects at UCL who work on transport. So now I've clicked the kind of transport button and clustered a group of people working on transport and the group of people who are working on um, Latin America at UCL. And then you've got the little cluster in the middle of those researchers. So this is just sort of a dynamic Venn diagram where you can create a picture of who. So if you want to also look at who's working on energy and transport in Latin America, you get a much smaller thing. Um, and this is just a tool that people, I wanted people to play with um, and to see whether or not it was um, interesting, whether it provoked a de debate. So I will be out in the foyer and you can all come and have a click and see if you feel that you've been represented accurately in terms of your research interests. Um, and it would be great, um, this was supposed to be an interactive tool to do that. Um, so that's the mapping. And then the other thing, just now we're gonna have a 20 minute fight while I get back of this. Um, the other output really was, was just the short film. Um, and I just wanted to show this image um, before I start it. Cause it really came So this, um, this is taken from the 1860s when, when London's main drainage system was being built. And what's happening is the woman is dropping her tea in disgust because science, so she's holding a microscope, and this has enabled her to see all the filthy things that are in the Thames. Um, and, and she suddenly really she doesn't want to drink it anymore. And for me, this is something that was coming out when I was hearing all the um, discussions about the kind of work that's going on at the moment, which is really interrogating the material the materials um, around us and encouraging us to look and using science to look differently. So from the kind of um, the, um, the fuel um, 
uh, cells that we were just talking about from algae um, and all this. So there's a real kind of research um, imperative when it comes to sustainable cities to really re-explore um, the kind of ontological basis that, um, from which we're building the knowledge. And so I'll just now show you the film, which um, hopefully will just be a bit of light relief after all the talking. Um, a water gate, which might be surprising because at the present moment we're standing in a sea of green in a park, um, the Embankment Park. But why it's so interesting is that it marks the northern boundary of where the Thames used to flow um, before Joseph Bazalgette built the embankments on which we now stand. Um, Basil Judd built the embankment in 1862 and really profoundly reshaped central London. Prior to the 1850s, there had still been, even in London, a working organic economy. There was a system that ensured that some human waste, at least, was reused, recycled as fertilizer. And that system made sense as a system until about 1848, when the market was undercut by the importation of guano, foreign guano, uh, especially from Peru, made the whole system stop making sense economically. Um, recycling human waste could no longer pay for itself. The debate over what the best way to deal with human waste was, I would say, one of the most fiercely contested of the mid-19th century. Very, very crudely, um, this debate pitted um, people who believed that water disposal was best against those who believed that land disposal was best. And this was called conservancy. Conservancy was actually about conserving rivers and natural water courses from the effects of pollution. Of course, famously, what happened to break the deadlock was that in 1858, London had record high temperatures, um, the Thames began to fester because of all of the human waste which had been accumulating in it. The Great Stink, as it was so called, really drove home to Parliament how urgently action was required and they finally passed various motions that allowed the construction of the drainage system to begin. So it was a much less considered decision than we might think of it today and it's certainly always presented as an example of uh, Victorian foresight and rationality and so on. But in fact, when you begin to look uh, in the period prior to the decision, 
you see that all, all was confusion. Um, there was very little consensus. There was no precedent for this type of project, certainly not on this scale. So they were winging it in a way that I think very rarely comes through uh, in history books today. When Bazalgette made this decision to have a combined sewer system, which meant that surface water runoff and sewage were going into the same pipe, he then had to um, deal with the question of what happens in an extreme rainfall event when the sewers fill up. And so you can't have sewage backing up into people's streets and homes. So the uh, response to that was to have overflows, combined sewer overflows, so that in a heavy rainfall event, dilute sewage would actually still flow back into the Thames. Uh, so it's basically a, a release valve kind of idea. Um, and that made sense because he designed it to happen not very often in terms of a relatively infrequent rainfall event and that that would be such an intense rainfall event that the sewage that was discharged into the river was quite dilute so it wouldn't have had a major environmental impact. What's happened in the intervening 150 years is that London has grown. We've paved over um, a lot of um, green and open surfaces. So the intensity of the rainfall event at which there's sufficient runoff to make the sewers fill up and overflow has become much more frequent. So that now happens on average 50 times a year that there's dilute sewage overflowing into the River Thames. So we've had this problem of combined sewer overflows into the Thames and they're happening at a greater and greater frequency largely because of the changed nature of the surface of London, that there's more hard surface so more runoff into the sewers. Um, but climate change will also likely increase the intensity of particularly summer rainfall events so this is going to be a growing problem. Um, and so there, were a whole, there was a whole study to look at different options for how to address this problem. Um, and the preferred option, which is now on the verge of being implemented, um, is effectively to build yet another intercepting sewer. So there's the Thames Tideway Tunnel, which will be a big tunnel under the Thames um, that will effectively collect those combined sewer overflows uh, instead of them flowing into the Thames. So the key alternative that a lot of people argue for is to try and effectively change the surface of London to stop so much runoff getting into the sewers to start with. The idea being that instead of water just rushing off concrete surfaces and hard roofs into a drain and away from our houses and streets as quickly as possible, that we find ways of actually storing water in our urban landscapes in a way that mimics how a natural hydrological system or a natural landscape would work. So this might mean putting green roofs on buildings that actually soak up and store a little bit of the water and then let it drain away slowly rather than quickly rushing off our roofs. Uh, it might mean rainwater harvesting, which is collecting some of that water and actually using it for toilet flushing or garden watering or other things. Uh, it might mean more ponds um, and wetlands and ways of infiltrating water or even storing water again in our parks, on our streets and generally in the urban environment to make London more like a sponge rather than just you know a heavy concrete surface that everything all flows off. And so the idea of that would be that it's solving the source of the problem um, which is too much water flowing into our sewers rather than simply building another sewer to cope with the extra water. The first time I came onto the roof 
was when I did my green roof training with some of the premier green roofers in the country. This particular one uh, was laid for uh, sustainable urban drainage because what the green roof does is it attenuates or holds water but the, the green roof has other benefits. Obviously, it delivers biodiversity, it delivers amenity. There's a, a vegetable garden here and flower garden where the staff come and they have their gardening club. I'm looking at green roofs through anthropological research and anthropology looks at the way that people make meaning out of the world around them and in particular I look at uh, material culture so I look at things, objects and in this particular case the, the, the plants and the, the green roof itself and how people make meaning from that both personally and in the political process, in the policy process and for people just coming onto the roof and using it in the amenity sense. Over the last 30 or 40 years we've seen a lot of changes in social values including the environment, including the need to take into account more diverse people within society. I think those are the things that engineering now needs to take better account of. We need to be able to better account for um, the environment as something not just a resource uh, for economic development but as something that is intrinsically valued by society itself and we also need to make sure that our developments do address the needs um, of groups that may have otherwise previously been excluded from public life, including women, people with disabilities, people from different racial and ethnic groups. Um, so I think those present some real challenges for how we do engineering differently. They present some real challenges for the engineering profession itself in terms of who are engineers. Um, and those are the kinds of things that we need to really grapple with in universities to try and push the boundaries of the industry um, from where it is now.